But our God is so wonderful. He's so good to us. He's given us the family of God to be a part of. You know, and, and as we celebrate Father's Day today in our nation and, and there's other nations in this world that are celebrating Father's Day too, we need to remember that, that we have a heavenly Father who loves us immensely, you know. And we, we want to honor and, and we want to appreciate our, our earthly fathers. Yes, we do. We, we thank you again. I recognize you. And th- but today's message is, is going to be a special message because it has to do with a father like no other. Now, the title of my message is Our Father, Our BFFF. What does that mean? Our Father, who is our best friend and father forever. Okay? our best friend and father forever. Now, do you know him? Do you know our Heavenly Father? You know, the, the reality of it is th- th- there's some of us here and some of us who may be watching later on, on the Internet there, you know, th- they grew up with a father who was actually pretty horrible, who wasn't even present a lot of times or, or was irresponsible. You know, and, and during your lifetime, you may have wished that you had a real father who really cared, who was good and was always there. No, but the good news is right now, today, I'm going to introduce you to a father who is just like I said, like no other. He's our best father and friend forever. Yeah, and he wants you to know him. Isn't that amazing? The God of heaven wants you to know him. Now, there's also those of you, you know, who had a wonderful father. And I praise God for that. I praise the Lord. I had a great father, you know. Uh, and I hope that, that this message is going to help you appreciate your good father even more. And, uh, and to those of you who, who are fathers, I just want to encourage you, you know, keep up the good work. I want to, to give you an example of the, the best father that we could possibly model ourselves against as fathers. And who is that? Our heavenly father, amen? Our best friend, our God, our, our, our best friend forever. Now, and in the Old Testament... The word father is used of God 15 times. But in the New Testament, Jesus used the term father, you know, uh, referring to God, to our father, over 165 times. And if you add Paul and the other uh, writers of the gospel, it's over 200 times that God is described as our heavenly father. And this is a little bit remarkable because when you look back in in the uh, Jewish literature, you know, you, you seldom find even the rabbis talking about God as their father. You know, in the New Testament, this was absolutely revolutionary. We need to understand that. You know, do you understand that Jesus is telling us that the creator of the heavens and the earth are our father, or is our father. The creator of the heavens and the earth is our father. Not only that, but Jesus uses some, some unique terms about, about our father. He uses... Uh, the word Abba. Now, Abba is an Arabic word, but it, uh, it means father, but it, it's, it's, in, it's in, an, in an endearing sense. We would say Abba means daddy or dad. So you understand that, that our God is not a father who is way off in distance and real formal with us, you know. Like you want, want, imagine what the old British fathers used to be, you know, in old England. They didn't hardly even know who their kids were, you know. But our father wants to be our daddy. He wants to be our dad. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And today, today, I want to share with you who our heavenly father is, you know, what he's like, and how you can have a real relationship with our heavenly father. So let's begin with the words of his first and only son, amen, Jesus Christ. And Jesus taught us how to pray, right? In Matthew chapter 6 and 9, he says, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. So the first thing I want you to know is that our Father is none other than, like I said, the God who is in heaven. And Jesus is very emphatic about teaching us to pray. You know, he says, in this way, pray. Pray in this way, our Father. And I love that, that, that word, that pronoun, our, okay? Because it's plural, it's inclusive, and it's proof that we are not alone, that we are family. We belong. Amen? We're We're not strangers in this world in the sense of not having a heavenly father or a family of believers to be a part of, right? We're strangers in this world only that we're separated from the sin of the world because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. 
but we are family members. God is our heavenly father. You know, our father is in heaven is none other than the creator. He's none other than the sovereign Lord God almighty. And I want to share with you a couple of qualities that our father has, okay? The first thing you need to know is that our father God is preeminent. Preeminent. Now, that word preeminent means above others. And when it comes to, to ranking, it means supremacy, superiority, the most important. You see, our Father in heaven, he is uniquely superior because there is no equal preeminence. If you're preeminent, you're number one. There's not two number ones, right? Because, because, of, because of his preeminence, though, what must we do with our lives? How must we relate to him? Our Father who is in heaven, it says in the scripture there what Jesus said, hallowed be your name. Well, you know, because, because of his preeminence, his name is to be hallowed. Well, what does it mean to be hallowed? That's not exactly a, a word we use every day in life, right? Well, it comes from a, a Greek word that means to make holy or to sanctify, okay? And what does sanctify mean then? Well, sanctify means to be set apart. You know, to, 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 to be uh, placed in a situation uh, that recognizes your uniqueness, okay? Because our Heavenly Father is preeminent, okay? He is the most important being in the universe, right? After all, He created the universe. He ought to be number one, right? Okay? He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? The creator of all of creation. That's who our Heavenly Father is. Now, the opposite of hallowing God's name is to profane his name. How do we do that? It's, it's when we live our life in such a way that, that you and I bring shame to our Father. You know, it's not treating him with respect. It's not treating our Heavenly Father with respect. So to be a good father, you must lead your family to the point where you <clears throat> and your entire family will hallow God's name, will, will, will lift him up as, as preeminent in your lives. In other words, will your family know that God, your heavenly father, is your priority and the most important thing in your family? You know, that's a radical way of living right now, right? That's not the way the world teaches us to live. What, what, what do I mean? You know, I'm going to give you an example here. Now, if you were to talk to your children, dads, if you were to talk to your children and <clears throat> ask them, <clears throat> what is the most important thing when it comes to your father? Or I should say, what is the most <clears throat> important thing to your father? Now, what would the answer be? Would, it, would uh, will your children say that the most important thing for my father is his career, his money, his social media, his, his hobby, his sports? You see... The way your children's going to answer that question is through observation, right? How do you spend your time, dads? Where do you spend your money? You know, what, what, what do you talk about? What excites you? What gets you motivated, okay? Now, that's what is going to determine the answer your children would give you. Now, my girls could recite, you know, my priorities to you because I told it to them often, and I sometimes preached about it. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Rebecca. <laughs> but what are my priorities? God, Gail, and my girls. I live by the three G's. God, Gail, and my girls, okay? And, and now, I, I got to admit that I did not always live up to that. That's my goal, right? Okay? Didn't always succeed to that, but my family knew that that's what I was striving for, you know? Now, when I fell short at times, I did pray to our Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive me, you know? And I asked him to change me and, and to make me more like him. I was, he's the perfect father, right? Okay? Uh, uh, and I, now, I retired from veterinary medicine, but I will never retire from being a father. You know, that's not something you, you put your hat up on and you get over with. And I love that. And our Heavenly Father never retires from being our Father either. Okay? Now, if you want to know if God takes priority in your life, ask your kids. Okay? And they'll tell you. If you find that you've been sending the wrong message, though, 
you know what? It's not too late to change. It's okay. Okay? You can put God as your priority from now on. You got to start somewhere, right? And your children are going to notice that. Now, a good father will be able to share with his children a model of making God preeminent, first place. According to Jesus, how you do that? He says do it by praying and living out this prayer. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when you pray, your kingdom come, you're recognizing that God is preeminent, okay? It's all about his agenda. It's all about his priority, not ours. Imagine, imagine that, you know? When you pray, your will be done, you're understanding that it's one thing to know God's will, but it's a whole different thing to do what God's will is for your life, right? Your kingdom come in my life, in this world. Doesn't our nation need God's will to be done in it right now? Don't you and I as individuals in our life, the things that we face in our life, don't we need God's will to be done in our life and stop trying to live it our own way? You know? And there's a famous song, and I've probably said this before, you know, and it's a lot of people, Elvis and, and Sinatra and all of them have done it, and, and it's that song, I Did It My Way. That is the most egotistical song that's out there. I don't want to do it my way. I've done it. I've messed up. Okay? I want to do it God's way. I want to do it the way of the Father. Okay? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Okay? Praise God. And, and that's how you show that your family, uh, to, that God is, is, is preeminent. You know? That's how, how your family knows that. To show the preeminence of God is not just talking about it. Okay? It's by our action. That's how we do it. Can your family see that God is their priority in your life? Yeah. And how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? What do you talk about? What excites you? you know? And I pray that, that God yeah, will be seen as preeminent in all of our lives. Amen. Not only to our children, but to the people we interact with in our communities. So they know that there are still people who love God, who will follow him, who listen to him, and who act accordingly. Amen. It's not just all mouth but it's also hands and feet and actions and arms that love and feed and nurture and care for people, okay? Why? Because, because you know, it, it's, it's necessary. Next, God is not only preeminent, but he is our provider, amen? Uh, verse 11 says this, give us this day our daily bread. Now, that word translated daily bread, you know, it's kind of an amazing word because it's not used by the classical Greek writers, Okay? In fact, it's, it's only used twice in the scripture, and it's both times it's, it's in the prayer that Jesus is teaching us right here. Both are dealing with this prayer of Jesus. Why? Because this word is so unique, many scholars actually think that, that the uh, writers of the gospel letters invented the word, okay? Because they compounded, they brought two words together, brought it together. And that word that is translated from the Greek, daily bread, means when today comes, Whatever my need is today, please provide. When today comes, whatever is my need for today, please provide. That covers a lot of things, doesn't it? It goes way beyond just your bread. It's everything in your life. You, that, I need some encouragement today, Lord. I need healing today, Lord. I need financial wisdom today, Lord. I've got some things I've got to decide on. I, I, I need help in my relationship today, Lord. I've got to speak to, to my children. I've got to speak to someone at work, and I've got to be firm about it. I've got to, but I want grace, and I want peace to be there. You know, all the things that are involved in our life, that's what we're talking about here. And our Father will help provide that, amen? A good father will provide. 1 Timothy 5 and 8 tells us this, and you've heard this before, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. You know, God expects fathers to provide for their family. Now, I know there's exceptions. There are fathers who, because of physical needs or some other need, that they actually can't work. We understand that. that we're, not, we're not talking about that or putting blame on them at all. But in a general sense, in the general culture, we should understand that fathers need to provide for their families. So many fathers are distant fathers. 
You know, this divorce has just ravaged our nation so much. The fathers aren't at home. They're not, they just see their kids, you know, once a month or, you know, every other week or something or, or maybe never, you know. But our father is our provider, and fathers are supposed to provide. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> how does God provide for us, though? How does he do that? What we can learn from Matthew 6, 25 and 6 tells us this. Jesus tells us this. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the, uh, of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Are you? Are you not worth much more than they? So here Jesus reminds us that uh, we have a heavenly father and that he tells us our heavenly father is going to feed even the birds of the field out there, okay? He's going to feed them. And if God will provide for the birds, how much more will he not provide for you and I, who, who his son came and died for and he brought into his family? God is a, a father who provides for the needs of his family. You see, Jesus wants to know that our heavenly father is not just a provider, but he's an amazing provider. Has God provided for you in your life? Amen. Has he given you peace in a time of trouble? Has he healed your body when you're sick? Has he, has he given you a love for somebody who's been pretty hateful to you, but you love them because you want them to know who Jesus is? Amen. I didn't hear any amens with that. <laughs> you know, our God provides, amen, everything we need. He's an amazing provider. And I was surprised to learn, though, that the average American father, guess how much time he spends with his, their children? About 20 seconds a day. I'm talking about a national average. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Now, how are you supposed to know the needs of your family if you're only spending 26 se seconds a day with your kids? You know? Unfortunately, you know, for most fathers, their focus is on physical needs. But I'm here to tell you there's more than physical needs that we have to deal with, Right? There's spiritual and emotional needs, too, that our kids need to have. You know, their needs need to be met. It's so important that a father is willing to spend time with their kids. Now, I remember, you know, when my kids were little, you know, talking with them as we shared a meal. We sat down. We'd see how the day was going and talked about things. You know, I was always the one who was in charge of feeding the youngest one at the time. I'd cut up the food. I'd put it on the spoon. And then I'd pretend like it was an airplane that had to land in their mouth. Okay? It was fun. I loved doing that, you know? I'd take them for walks in the woods. We had a, had a yard, and we had woods around us, and I'd show them, you know, caterpillars and butterflies and lizards and frogs and, and squirrels, and, 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 and I would tell them, hey, God made all of that for them. You know, it's amazing, just spending a little time. You know, I'd read Bible stories to them, and, and, and I would pray with them. You interact. They knew that Gail and I loved God and we loved them. Isn't that true, Rebecca? Say amen. There you go. All right. You see, you got to be involved with your kids, you know. So I ask your fathers, you know, do you know the needs of your children? Are you praying with them? Are you talking with them? Are you interacting with them? Are you listening? You know, not only does our Heavenly Father know our needs, but he's able to provide all that we need. That's incredible. Matthew 7, 9 through 11 says this. Listen. Or what man is there, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> or what man is there who, uh, among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now, these verses tell us something about our Heavenly Father, don't they? You know, he not only knows what we need, he's not only to provide for all of our needs, but he knows what is best in our needs. Now, what I mean by that, here it is. Here's the contrast here. What man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish... 
he will not give him a snake, will he? And what Jesus is saying here is simply this. God will not give you something that is bad for you. Okay? God will not. How many times have you blamed God, though, for doing that? But God is not going to give you something that's bad for you. He is not going to do that. If you ask uh, something of God, God's not going to answer, you know, and, 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 excuse me. If you ask for something and God is not answering your prayer at that time the way you want it, possibly he's saying, well, not now. You're not ready for it. Or he could be saying, I'm sorry, you're asking something that is not good for you, and I'm not going to give it. You see, God knows what is best in our lives, amen? And he also knows the best time to give it to you. He's always perfect in his timing. So how does God provide for us? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Now, I'm reminded of a story that's in 2 Kings you know, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, you're familiar with that. The husband of the widow had died. She's got two sons that are left. And now you understand in the Old Testament times that, that widows, they were not taken care of. There wasn't any system of support, okay? They were in dire straits. And, and so here's the story of the widow whose husband has died, okay? And that widow was in deep trouble, very deep financial trouble. And uh, she was about to lose everything, including her children. Her sons were going to be sold off to pay for her debt, you know? Now, now this, was, uh, now, now this is, an, is an amazing thing about her Heavenly Father because he provides even in this drastic situation. So, so what did God tell this widow through the pro- prophet Elisha? Verse 2 says this, Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Now imagine being that destitute, only having a jar of oil left in your household. And then this is what Elisha, though, taught the widow about God. Verse 3 says, Then he said, Go, borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. I love that last little part right there. Don't get a few. Get all you can, okay? So she asked, she was asked to do something, right? And to borrow a lot of vessels, as many as you can. And then that was her part. But look on in verses 4 and 5. It says, And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. In other words, the sons also had a part to do, right? They had to do something. They had to borrow the empty vessels, okay? They borrowed them left and right. Wherever they could get vessels, they went to get them. Now, the Bible continues on in in verse 6 and 7. It says, when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one more vessel left, okay? And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Wow. Listen to that. How did God provide? God provided by asking her and her sons to do something. You see, God often will provide our need, but many times we fail to do our part, and we might not get what God has provided for us, right? But in this case, God told her, you borrow as many vessels as you can, okay? Now, can you imagine if her sons had been lazy and didn't do it? Or if they had been embarrassed to go borrow some vessels and not done it? You know? But God provides when we do our part as he leads us, right? Okay, so what we've learned, what have we learned about our Heavenly Father so far? He's preeminent, right? And our Heavenly Father, he is our provider, He's preeminent, and he's provider. Now, the next thing we can learn about our Heavenly Father is that he pardons. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that our God is a loving Heavenly Father, and he forgives us. Matthew 6 and 12 says, And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, the word forgives comes from a compound word that means to get rid of. All right? God gets rid of our sins. So when the Bible says forgive us, Our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, guess what? Jesus wants to know that our Heavenly Father is a forgiving Father, and He gets rid of our debt. 
Even better than Dave Ramsey can, right? That's why he tells us that we have to forgive. If he's forgiven us all these de the debt of our sin and, and the shame and the guilt that we've had, if he's forgiven us that, how can we not forgive those who have harmed us? In fact, forgiveness is so crucial, okay, that in the following verses, uh, Jesus says this, if you forgive others of their transgression, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But I want you to notice something. If it goes on, it says, if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Wow. Mm. You mean we have to live out our faith? Oh, yeah. We have to live out our faith. Now, now you know, forgiveness is not an option, folks. It's not. Why? First of all, our Heavenly Father, right, is forgiving, right? And he pardons us. And because we are forgiven people, we've been, for, we've been forgiven for all of our sins and doubt and shame and everything. God expects us to forgive others. And that means that forgiveness is not an option. Now, I realize that there are many families, you know, are really, who really have problems in their relationship with one another. Just, just that agony, that, that unforgiveness, that, that bitterness is there. And you know why? It's simply because they don't understand that our Heavenly Father is patient and kind and forgives us. That He forgives us and He wants us to forgive one another too. You know, so we've got to ask ourselves, fathers, have we developed a culture of forgiving in our family? Have we done that? You know, children, you need to also forgive your dad. Now, he may be working on perfection, but let me tell you, he hadn't reached there yet. None of us have, right? So it's, it's a, a culture of forgiveness where dad and mom can forgive the kids and the kids can forgive the dad and the mom because we all know that we're not perfect, but we're going to work through together. We're going to follow God's word and his way, and we're going to make it through in a victorious way, right? Now, in our family, you know, we have strived to have a culture of forgiveness because none of us, like I said, are perfect. We're not. You know, I'm not perfect, and I'm going to disappoint my children, and I'm going to disappoint Gail every now and then. You know, at some point it's going to happen. Okay? But what do we do? What do we do? And what do we mean by God is forgiving? Look, look at Psalms 103, 8 through 11. <clears throat> This is so beautiful, and if we can apply God's characteristic to our life, it's, it's, it can be transforming here. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. Oh, those are beautiful words right there. He's compassionate and he's gracious, slow to anger and ab abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us. That means he's not always going to be fighting with us, you know, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, not, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. See, everything you see Jesus teaching us about our Heavenly Father has to deal with his love. It's amazing, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace. Because he loves us, he forgives us. Because our Father loves us, he forgives us. Because he loves us, he provides for us. Because he loves us, he, 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 his loving kindness is not short. It's there for us. It's an amazing word. It's a special word that's given to God's people. Loving kindness of God. See, the whole emphasis is God's willingness to forgive us. Our Heavenly Father is willing to forgive us. Are you willing to ask Him for it? Now, notice, He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. I praise God that He doesn't do that, right? You know, He's not dealt with me according to, to, to my sinfulness. Praise the Lord. He's not rewarded me according to my iniquities because I've always fallen short on that. But by His grace, I am saved. I am born again. I'm brought into the family of God. He remakes me. He renews me, renews me and transforms me into the image of Christ. Amen. 
through the working of his word, through, through the church fellowship that we have in our church, through, through sharing the gospel and meeting people's needs, to listening to people and, and asking God, how can I be a part of, of a resolution for that person's problem? Be involved in your faith. It's wonderful. You know, why? This, this tells us that, that God is compassionate. God is gracious. And you see, the forgiveness of God is based on his compassion and based on his grace. I love that. Because God is a forgiving God. He is slow to anger. Thank you. You know, my God, our heavenly father, does not have a temper that is just like that. Praise the Lord. Because he'd be firing off at me all the time. (laughs) Praise God. His, his love is abounding for us. And that's what the Bible verse is saying here. I want you to notice in, um, in, in Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So remember that the east and the west, they never meet, right? They never meet. And that's the meaning of forgiveness. You let go of it. You don't count it against them any longer. You forget about the problem. You don't keep a record of the wrong. Okay, As far as the east is from the west, how far is that? Well, that's an infinite distance. You know what infinite means? Without end. So forgiveness is letting go. Verse uh, 13, it says this, Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Our Heavenly Father, he forgives and he pardons. That's beautiful, isn't it? Now, I'm remi- reminded of a story that Ernest, Ernest Hemingway wrote. And he talked about a father and a teenage son who were having serious problems. So much problems that the son decided he's going to leave. He left home, okay? And the rebellious son left home, and the dad was mad about it. He was upset that the, that the rebellious son left home. But after a while, the father realized that he really did love his son. And, and, and he wanted to look for his son. So what did he do? He, he goes to the town newspaper, and he puts in a, 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 a note there. And it says, Dear Paco, the son's name was Paco. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. Well, the next day at noon, he had the shock of his life because there were 800 Pacos there. <laughs> What does that mean? Does that mean there's a lot of kids named Paco? Or does it mean there's a lot of kids who need some love and forgiveness from their father? Wow. Friends, you know, I don't, I don't know about your family, but, but we all long for forgiveness, don't we? You and I long for forgiveness, and our kids long for forgiveness too. And since we've been forgiven, shouldn't we also forgive? Amen. So, so we've learned this about our Heavenly Father so far. He's preeminent. He's our provider, and he pardons. He's preeminent, he's our provider, and he pardons. You know, he's preeminent, so we need to give him highest priority, right? He's our provider, so we can trust in him. Our needs are going to be met. And he pardons, so we should too. You know, he's patient, you know, and, and because he's like that, we can come to him being honest and open, and he'll listen, and he'll get us through. Amen. Our Heavenly Father also, though, protects. And what do we mean by our Heavenly Father protects? Well, a good father always protects. Let's look here at Matthew chapter 16. where Jesus is continuing in the prayer. <clears throat> and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I want to emphasize, emphasize the words, do not lead us into temptation. Okay? The word temptation there, it comes from a Greek word that actually means trials and hardship. Okay, the word temptation uh, means that, but delivers from evil. Evil in this instance, in this case, means pain and suffering. So that's a legitimate prayer, okay? It's fine to do that. It's okay to expect the Father to protect you and to guide you. So it's a prayer of prevention. That's what we're talking about here. It's a prayer requesting that God will look after our future needs. And we need protection from bad choices that we've made, right, and bad decisions we've made. Uh, the, the word interpreted as temptation can be used in a positive and a negative way, though. 
And what do I mean by that? Look at James 1 and 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, we are not to say that God is tempting us to sin or to do evil. Because God's character, okay, his character, his nature is completely good, is completely void of evil. So since there's no evil in God, right, there's no evil in him, he is a God who cannot be tempted by evil, and nor would he ever entice anyone to do anything evil, to do anything that's sinful, okay? Now that's the negative use of temptation here. But the positive use, there's certain times that we're, listen, Certain trials and hardships God allows in our lives. Why is that? This is a positive actual use of the term temptation, though, when it means trials. Let's look here at 1 Peter uh, 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof, proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, the purpose of this kind of trial okay, is going to benefit us. The proof of your faith in the midst of a trial okay, brings praise and glory and honor to Jesus Christ as he is revealed in that trial. Okay? Now, God wants us to know whether our faith is real or not. Is your faith real or not? Why? Because faith is absolutely crucial. It's crucial. The Bible tells us that our faith is more precious than gold and it needs to be genuine faith. Genuine faith, okay? Genuine faith will in, uh, 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 impact your eternity. God is saying that he allows trials that are not meant to destroy you, but are meant to build you up, to lift you up, to benefit you. The objective, actually, in the midst of all the trials is for you to receive a blessing. <coughs> That's a good thing to know. Now, when God allows us to have trials, those are calibrated trials. Those trials are never too little and never too much. There's just amount of trials in your life. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us this. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able? But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, that truth is a lot of comfort to me. You know, it should comfort all of us. You know, you know why? Because it tells me that whatever trial, whatever problem, whatever thing that, that, uh, that I'm facing, that God has allowed to, to come into my life, that he already knows about that trial. He knows about it, okay? He wasn't surprised by it. You know, it's there to build me up, and God uh, will not give me a trial that is beyond his strength to help me overcome. If God created the universe with just thinking about it and speaking it, surely he can overcome the menial problems I face in life, right? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life, but, but, but fathers, can I tell you something? It's your job to protect your family, to protect your children. It's your job to prepare them to face trials. Because guess what? Everybody faces trials. Every, I don't care what age you are. You know, little babies face trials. Kids who crawl on the ground face cr trials, like eating bugs and stuff like that. My, Rebecca did that one time. We caught her eating a roach, you know. So we all face trials in life, right? But you've got to be prepared for that. You know, but what does a godfather do? A go a go not a godfather, a good father do? Uh, and our godly father, a good father wants to protect his children from unnecessary trials and harm, right? So, so how does, a, how does the, uh, a father do that? Well, many times a father does that, okay, by disciplining us. 
Oh, boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? The Bible tells us, okay, right there in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son, son who receives him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. For, the Lord, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Indeed. So those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, right? And this, the discipline is something that you're going to be able to endure. You're going to make it through it. How many times have you faced a trial and think, there is no way, how in the world am I going to get through this? All of you made it. I see you right here in the room. You're here. You made it, didn't you? Especially if you knew the Lord, you could see his hand providing the way. And many times God's going to allow, you know, circumstances, or I shouldn't say circumstances. God's going to allow consequences of our bad decisions to uh, be part of our discipline. Why? To teach us lessons, okay? Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. Means he allows some things to happen that he knows going to be bad in your life. But remember, he's there. He's going to give you the power to endure it, but not only endure it, but to perfect your faith in the process, okay? So, so the way God protects us is often through discipline. And discipline is not always fun, is it? It's not. But Hebrews 10 says this. It contrasts the discipline that we receive from our parents and the discipline that we receive from God. For they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, meaning the Father, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. That's the perfecting of our faith, okay? So God allows trial, trials. But sometimes in our humanity, we think that God allowing tri trials in our lives is some way that he's punishing us. It is not punishment, okay? It's not punishment. It, it, it's God working us to shape us and to mature us. Mature us. Can't speak this morning. Hebrews 12, 11 says this. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So many fathers don't really properly discipline their children. Now often... This leads to them either being overprotecting or not, no discipline at all, leading to spoiling to them, okay? So the Bible tells us a good father will discipline their children, but the purpose is never to punish, okay? The purpose is to train. No wonder that Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 tells us this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So what does it mean, do not provoke your children to anger? In other words, it's possible for fathers and mothers alike to over-discipline by being over-controlling. Now, this happens when you don't know how to properly discipline, okay? When you, when you over-control your children, you provoke them to anger. Fathers and mothers alike fail in the area of discipline by going to the extremes in both directions, okay? One extreme is the over-controlling thing I just talked about. Everything is no, 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 no. There's too many limits. There's too many restrictions, and you don't allow the child to stretch and to grow a little bit, okay? The other extreme is no discipline at all. And what happens when you have no discipline in life? You become a spoiled, rotten brat. Boy, our culture is full of that, isn't it? Okay? But, but uh, so either way, though, it's wrong, right? Okay, so the Bible tells us how we do need to protect our children, how to do it. Remember, a good father protects. He not only provides, he not only pardons, but he protects. So how do we protect them? The last part of uh, Ephesians 6, 4 tells us that. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's so important that your kids know God and know his word, okay? 
Fathers, you know, you only have so much time with your kids. And believe me, I know that. I blinked my eyes and all my kids grew up, and they had kids themselves. You know, you only have so much time with them. So you've got to understand something. You, someday that your children are going to grow up and say goodbye to you. They're going to go out on their own. And it's during these times that you need to be confident. You need to be confident that you have trained them up in the ways of the Lord. Okay, that you, you've disciplined them in such a way that you've internalized God's values into their lives. Made it a part of who they are, okay? Now, now, are we protecting our children the way we need to be? That's the question we need to ask. Do we warn them? Do, do, do we guide them? Are we faithful in that? Now, a good father is also passionate, though, okay? Passionate about his children. Our Heavenly Father is passionate about us. Absolutely. Now, you may not really realize it, but, but, but God loves you so very, very much. He really does. You know, everything that you see in, uh, God doing, He's doing it because He loves you. Absolutely. He loves you. The Bible tells us in 1 John 3 and 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. That we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. See, the Bible is very emphatic about our Father's love for us. See how great the love of the Father has bestowed on us. You know, it's not just love, it's the amazing love of God. And do you know that God loves you? Do you know it? Yeah. Do you know that God loves you so much that you, he is Wanting to call you his child. Now, how, how does he become your heavenly father? The Bible tells us there in 1 John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now, do you know something? notice something about this verse? It tells me that not all people are automatically the children of God. It tells us that as many as receive him, you know, you have to do your part. It goes back to that part, okay? You have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now, why should you believe in Jesus? Why should you believe in Jesus? You know, why should you receive Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord? Well, the Bible gives us the answer in Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. See, I'm going to emphasize the fact that this verse tells us that in the fullness of time, okay, God had already had it planned all out from the very beginning, but when it was the right time, Jesus came. And what, why, why did he come? What was the purpose? So that we, uh, he might redeem us. He might pay the price for our sins. He might pay the price for our debt, right? And he gets rid of all our debt, right? Okay? So he might do that so that he can redeem us, that we might be adopted as sons and be forgiven, Sons and daughters of a living God who loves us so much that, that he cared and had a plan from the very beginning to redeem us. The very reason why Jesus came is so that you and I can become children of the Father. The very reason he came. Now, don't take this lightly, okay? To become a child of God is, a, is, is an amazing privilege. It's, a, it's an amazing honor. You know, it, it's an amazing blessing to be a child of God. My prayer and my goal this morning, okay, is to help all of you to get connected with your Heavenly Father, to know who He is, because, because he, he is the perfect Father. Okay? He's the eternal Father. He's the best Father. He's the best friend Father. Okay? And my role as a human father and as a pastor is to see that my children, both my physical and my spiritual children, Understand that they have a heavenly father who's eternal and will always be with them. He's the perfect father who can provide better than I can. He, he, he's, he, he can protect them better than I can ever do. 
He's a God who can love them better than I can love them. You know, my prayer is that all of you come to know your heavenly Father. Do you know him? Do you know God our Father who is in heaven? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, not mine. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give me today my daily bread, everything that I need. And forgive me as I have forgiven those who have trespassed against me. For yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. My prayer is that this message will inspire you to know that he's a father like no other. He truly is our best father and friend forever, our BFFF. Okay? If your father, if you are a father today, you know what? You can become a better father. I can, you can, we all can. If you don't have a father, or some people who, who father is not living or they really never knew their father, I want you to know that you can at this time have a father like no other. Also, if you, if you have a father and was disappointed by him, hey, it's not too late for your father to be changed and saved too, right? Pray for that. It's vitally important for you to know that we come to a father through faith in Jesus Christ, the son. We have a father who is the perfect father. Why? Those five things, okay? He's preeminent. He provides. He pardons. He protects. And he passionately loves us. Now today we honor all fathers, right? But more than that, we want to honor the greatest father. Our Heavenly Father. We want to know our Heavenly Father as only a father can with a child. Now, if you want to know that, I want you to pray with me right now. So just bow your heads and close your eyes. Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I want to claim your promise today. That as many as receive your son Jesus. That you will give them the right to become your children. So Lord Jesus. I will receive you today as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for the opportunity you have given me. To invite you to become my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sin so that I can have a relationship with God the Father. I now invite you as my Lord and Savior. I accept your gift of forgiveness. I accept your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, because I'm going to be the first to tell you, just because you recite something I tell you to say, that doesn't do diddly. All right? Only if you mean it from your heart. Then it's transformative, and it makes an eternal difference in your life. So think about that. Think about your heavenly father. Think about your earthly father. Be grateful and be thankful. And remember that your Father is with you even in the midst of those trials that He's using to shape you and to form you so that you can be more like Him. And you can affect the lives of other people. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's about Him. Because His plan, His will, and His love is all that we need to change the world we're living in right now. We can be bitter and we can complain and, 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 and be angry at our government and at our culture. But hey, our purpose is to share the love of our Heavenly Father. Amen. I do want us to close in prayer and pray for our nation, okay? And to pray for our families and to pray for our fathers and our mothers. So let's close one more time in prayer. Can you stand to your feet as we close in prayer now? 